I couldn't tell even my friends and family that I lost a job. It, I tried to cover it up and so on. And with that, I fell into a depression. If like me or someone that struggles with the mental health, yes, I know it's a pain in the ass, but you are not alone, as you'll see from this podcast. In this podcast episode, I'm lucky enough to be joined by Dad, top Ironman triathlete and the author of the international bestseller, Executive Loneliness, Nick Johnson. Amongst other things, we talk about how to avoid the mental health crisis that's sweeping the business world. I think your work you're doing is invaluable. I've personally struggled with my mental health for years. I'm pretty sure that the majority of the people that listen to my podcast are people who may have struggled or experienced of mental health issues. For the benefit of my listeners, introduce yourself and tell us a bit about what the work you do. Yeah, sure. So my name is Nick Johnson. I was born in Sweden, educated in Australia, and then I lived and worked the last sort of 20 years in Southeast Asia. And uh, yeah, mental health, social health, physical health, that is what I'm working on these days. I started in the corporate world and with the last sort of 10 years worked my way out of it. I looked at your book and I was touched to see that it was dedicated to a friend of yours, Simon, who, who very sadly died of, of suicide. Was that the main reason for wanting to write the book? I was on the topic already before following that I'd gone through a, a crisis myself and I hit perhaps what I call my rock bottom in 2018. So then I, I found a way back. I had recovered and in 2019, then I sadly lost Simon and that sort of made me wake up and realize that I couldn't have gone down this path as well. And so it sort of fueled me and triggered me to perhaps take more action than I otherwise would have. And that's why I wanted to really keep going on this and not only raising the awareness about it, but breaking the stigma around having these conversations. Do you feel comfortable to talk about the situation in 2018? Absolutely. I can, I can be as open as you wish. When did you first notice that your mental health was, was, was suffering? I had been let go a couple of times from various jobs in the past. And when it happened, it seemed like I was not ready. I was not prepared. I got very anxious, worried about the future. I also felt that I couldn't tell even my friends and family that I lost a job, it, I tried to cover it up and so on. And with that, I fell into a depression as well. Then when I got a new job, things were good again. And then when I lost the job, then the same thing repeated itself. And then in 2015, though, I, I was perhaps at the peak of my career, but suddenly I started to lose some of my confidence. I started to make mistake in the job and I thought, well, here we go again. I'm just going to be terminated again. But then I thought it's better that I take charge of this. So I uh, resigned from a job without any clear sort of plan what to do next. And with that, I became delusional. With that, I pushed everyone away from me and including filing for divorce. And then with that, I traded my healthy lifestyle for a bar stool, my gym membership, then instead for hanging out after work, drinking beer. And with that, I lost basically everything, my health, my financials and my family. Yeah, I think it's a slippery slope. A lot of things you've just said there resonated with me. I was in a similar position Christmas last year where I was in a job that wasn't making me very happy and I could actually see that I, I kind of felt that I was being pushed out. So like you, I thought I, I need to make a plan and I need to do something. So I actually resigned from that job. But obviously as a parent and the main provider, there is this massive pressure to provide and have a plan and even if you're providing for yourself, if certainly if you're providing for a family, there is this pressure that I think a lot of men struggle with. And I think it doesn't feel good to admit that you're struggling. And I think that's where a lot of men, we lose a lot of good men because I think it isn't socially acceptable yet to actually say, I'm really struggling. I don't really have the answers. I need some help. Absolutely, James. And I, I agree with you. There's many men who are struggling with this. Uh, these days I'm running a men's group where we are connected. We are about 17 guys in this group at the moment. We meet once a week on Zoom for one hour where we just discuss what's going on in our lives. And these are the kind of conversations we talk about, you know, it's about providing, but also the pressure that comes with that, especially now when it's uncertain times. And we have a few of the men in the group who are without employment now, and they really, really struggling. They are struggling to get back on the treadmill 
because we lose, we not only lose our income and perhaps the people around us then, but we lose part of our identity. Unfortunately, we are too attached and too, dem- too reliant on, on the job and everything it provides for us. Yeah, I think the difficult thing is, I think the world still demands that men are the providers. Obviously, things are a lot more equal than they were, but I think to an extent, whether that's a pressure we as men put on ourselves, I don't know. But I certainly feel that, I mean, my wife works full time. She's a teacher. She brings in an equal amount of the income. But in my mind, the box stops at me. In my mind, it's on me. So I'm now self-employed. I now work. I do podcast editing. And every time I lose a big client, which I have done recently, I have a couple of sleepless nights of just thinking, right, okay, we're back. Keeping the wolf from the door. The, the mortgage payments come irrespective of whether I got work or not. And there is that underlying pressure. So I think I love what you're doing with your group because I actually think, although it's important to have a, a, a relationship where you can talk to your partner, I actually find it easier to talk to men because I think men get it in a way. And certainly anything to do with marriage problems or money problems, you're not going to be judged by another man, I don't think. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think it's important also to put some ground rules and we are made very clear that the, the sessions, when we log on, we are there for supporting each other. It's confidential. Whatever is discussed is kept there. We feel that it is our safe space. And we can, what I can tell since we started the group, I'm in now in January this year for every week, sort of, we open up more and more. We start to build more trust in the group. And I refer to this as practicing or training our vulnerability muscle. And that is something that we men need to do at that didn't come natural to me before. I had fantastic mates. We used to play golf together, go and watch football or whatever, go and drink beer in the bar. We had a great time together, but I wasn't open. I wasn't vulnerable. I didn't want to bother them perhaps with my challenges that I was going through. So perhaps I might have left the office feeling stressed and there was something going on. I go to meet them at the bar to have a few drinks and relax a bit. But when I'm coming back to the office the next day, the same issues were there. What I do differently now when I have a safe place in a group like that, I decide to take notes of the things that are actually bothering me. And then I discuss them. And then just getting that sympathy and that understanding from other men and hearing what they did. When, because surely they gone through these simulations before. That is making a huge impact and a difference. Yeah, I agree. It, it's brave of you to do that. But it's, I think it's essential for, for men like you and me who feel confident enough or passionate enough to sort of say, right, we got, we got to grab the nettle and talk about this because I think you're right. Men in an office, we talk, we, there's banter, there's fun, there's chat, there's jokes, but quite often it is superficial. But the thing that's ironic is that whenever I've actually admitted struggles in family life or married life or my mental health, all you tend to do is inspire other people who are in basically having the same thoughts and worries to go, do you know what, actually, now that you come to talk about it, now that basically you've been the first person, no one wants to be the first. Uh, so what you're doing sounds brilliant. And I, I think it's hopefully more and more of these groups are going to, your group's going to develop, but certainly from the book that you've written, because I imagine sort of the, the executive world is probably quite a macho environment. So the idea about talking about your feelings is probably an absolute polar opposite to what I imagine most men in the office think is appropriate. Absolutely. And it's only since uh, I had my fall and I hit my rock bottom in 2018 that I even started to consider sharing my story, talking about my feelings and asking for help. And uh, sadly, we shouldn't have to drop that low. At my bottom in 2018, Yeah, I had gained a lot of weight. I lost my finances and health and so on. But I also picked up an alcohol addiction then from something that I managed to control before in the good times. Once I was out of the job in a divorce that I used alcohol to medicate myself and escape uh, from the reality. And that became an issue. And once I started to own up to that and seeking help, I, I found one of those beautiful recovery programs. And these days we have recovery programs for all kinds of addictions, not only alcohol, but drugs overeating, sex, shopping, gambling, and everything else. There's something for all of them. And the good thing in these groups uh, are that there's people there who's gone through it before. There's people who are there to give back. And there's a saying in that recovery community that you've got to give it back to keep it. 
And that means that us who've been there before have to come back. So while I'm approaching seven years sobriety now, I have actually been to four recovery meetings this week to help give back to bringing in newcomers. I helped one of my friends checking into a rehab two days ago and supporting him to get the help that he needs. And that is the beautiful thing here. But my point here being that if I hadn't had that crisis, I wouldn't have been as open. I wouldn't have been as vulnerable and even ready to discuss my feelings to this extent. So as men should, though, I, as we're talking here, to find some safe spaces, it doesn't have to be a rehab or perhaps a 12-step program. We can have these conversations otherwise anyway, is what I believe. Yeah, I agree with you. That's kind of why I started the podcast in the first place. In some ways, hitting rock bottom is on the other side of that place is growth and embracing your vulnerability it is often where you find the amazing things that happen in your life. But as you said, if there's a group or there's a podcast you can listen to or there's a book you can read, maybe you don't have to get to that depth because that depth isn't a place I would ever want anyone to go to because it's, it's not good. And I think the problem is, Certainly in Britain, we have a major drinking culture and it's always a slippery slope. You can have a couple of beers every night. It can creep in. I certainly have to keep an eye on that. I take my hat off to you being seven years sober. That's amazing. I, 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 do, I definitely don't drink nearly as much as I, as I used to, but I still have a drink every now and again. I think it's finding your coping strategies, isn't it? And, and, and managing them. The irony that I find is that we seem to be in a loneliness epidemic. We've never had more ways to communicate with each other but we've never felt more distance from each other. But I think the work you're doing, which is meeting, having a group that is not superficial, is actually dealing with major issues is ideal. Yeah, so we need those safe spaces, but then also I believe that we need other parts of our, our society where we can also meet. And uh, I'm a big believer in also finding our own tribe, uh, finding our own hobby or whatever that is. And I was looking back at my childhood and asking myself, what did I love to do as a child? I even asked my parents and people around me. And I, as an adult, I tried to pick up those hobbies. And actually, my mom showed me a photo album as me as a child. And on every second page, I was out cycling. So I doubled down on cycling and I have cycles everywhere I go now. I try to, to go out cycling and I will be out tomorrow morning here for a bike ride and doing that in a social group with like-minded who speak your language, also like cycling, there's a great way to socialize. You get some sunlight, you're out in the forest and breathe some fresh air. So you tick all those boxes and belonging to something and feeling that is a meaning because too many times we can hide behind our digital devices. And while that's great from like how we are today and that this podcast and other content, we also need our in-person experience. And shouldn't only be men's group or recovery groups, but also it's important to have a life outside of that is what I'm a big believer. I really hope you got something for this podcast and to find out more about the work that Nick does and to contact him, visit his website. I'll put the link in the show notes. All right, wherever you are in the world, you're okay. Take care. Hey dad, here's a word from our sponsor. Do you miss having something interesting to read in those very odd five minute breaks from the trench warfare that can be family life? If so, check out www.swifthalf.com. Sign up to their newsletter for jaw-dropping news, some light-hearted nonsense, exclusive offers and guides.